Welcome to Rural Remix, your source for deeper, richer stories about life in rural places. Where do horror movies happen? Small towns, dark forests, cornfields, and farmhouses have each been the locations for iconic scary films. But why are rural settings so popular, and how do these choices affect the areas represented? The Rural Horror Picture Show is a five-part series that explores the often flawed, but always interesting, depiction of rural people and places in horror movies. Today, we are zooming out to examine the real-world impact of rural horror movies. From economic boosts to persistently harmful stereotypes, these films have left their mark. Hello, and welcome to the Rural Horror Picture Show. I'm Anya patron Slepian. I'm Susanna Brown. And this is our fifth and final episode. Hooray! Aww. I know. <laughs> <laughs> kind of sad, kind of exciting. Yeah. So today we are doing a bit of a different style episode where mm-hmm. we are both going to talk about the lasting effects of rural horror movies, some of the ones that we've been discussing throughout the series. But before we get to that, we're going to stick sort of with tradition and talk about something else first. (laughs) And that thing that we're talking about is the most haphazard statistical analysis that has ever been done. It was done by yours truly. I took exactly one semester of statistics in college, which means I'm good enough at statistics to identify the dozens of ways that this is not very good analysis. (laughs) But it didn't do enough statistics to learn how to do analysis better, uh, at least not in short notice. So (laughs) what are you statistically analyzing for us, Anya? I am statistically analyzing, again, in the most loose way, how common it is for horror movies to be in rural places and settings. Yes, that is what this podcast is about. What did did you find out? (laughs) Yeah, well, you know, because we have all these examples, but I was just interested, sort of more broadly speaking, how many or what percentage Mm. we're talking about. Got it. So what was your methodology to get this done? Yeah, good question. Super thorough. Um, I (laughs) went online and I looked for, you know, one of those lists of best horror movies of all time. And there are all sorts of websites that have all sorts of lists. A bunch of them were like the 200 best horror movies of all time. And I said to myself, you know what? I'm not entering 200 movies into a spreadsheet. Sure. So I found a list um, from Empire that was the best 50 horror movies of all time. And I said, that sounds doable. And so for each movie... On that list, I wrote it down and I (laughs) searched the Wikipedia or Google or, you know, just enough to figure out where the setting was and then did the next step of, you know, determining whether that setting could or should be considered rural. Got it. So of the 50, how many were rural? Yeah. So of the 50, I found that 19 were pure and arguably rural with another 10 that had really strong rural elements. Mm. And remember that these are not necessarily movies that I've seen. But when you read the description, it would say they were in Seattle and then they go to a super spooky isolated island to find the truth. Mm. And so for me, that spooky island plus Seattle counts as a rural element, even though the whole movie doesn't take place entirely in rural. So if my also one semester of statistics uh, <laughs> helps me, that is 19 plus 10, which gives us 29, 29 out of 50. 29 out of 50, which is more than half. Wow. And then some, you know, ones that are just in a haunted house, and that's hard to say. Yeah. And so the, I think the point that I want to make here is that when we've been talking about these movies, we have only been looking at movies that are overtly rural. And so that could be seen as talking about a small subset of the horror movies that are out there. But if you look at, again, this very illustrious study conducted by (laughs) a world-renowned statistician, while we were only looking at the specific subset, this subset is sort of disproportionately large in the larger horror genre, or at least the top 50 (laughs) horror movies as ranked by a random listicle online. Yeah, I feel validated in our creation of the podcast, noting that this is something (laughs) that happens disproportionately. So thank you for this study. I feel (laughs) feel good about it. Absolutely. It really takes a lot for me to open a spreadsheet. And so uh, I'm glad that it was worthwhile. Absolutely. (laughs) 
So like you said, Anya, today is our zoom out episode where we are going to be taking a look at some of the real world implications, impacts of the movies that we've been discussing over the last four episodes. Mm -hmm. And I have an example I'd love to start with because it's one that I think I could just read about the impacts of this movie forever, uh, and that's Blair Witch Project. Oh, yeah. Which, as we discussed in our last episode, had unique marketing. (laughs) Um, People thought it was real, right? So, like, that in itself makes it have a super unique world impact because Mm -hmm. it's not often that people aren't totally sure if a movie that they watched was a documentary or not. Right. Because the alternative is that it's a snuff film, right? It's like you're actually watching people die, which is scary and bad. The first real world impact I want to talk about before we get into what the impact was for the real life town of Burkittsville, Maryland, is um, an impact on the actors. And I'm sure that there is a lot more I could say about this because it was a really intense and grueling filming process because Mm -hmm. these actors like actually did spend time in the woods I think it was like really stressful in a lot of ways but one thing I wanted to point out is that all of the actors use their actual real names which kind of like added to the realism component of the the film and so one of the actors Heather Donahue actually changed her name Mm. she told GQ in an interview that using her real name was her quote biggest life regret to this day quote You know, she talks about how it, like, really formed her entire adult life. Mm -hmm. Her name was this movie because of how unsure people were about the reality of it, especially when it came out. You know, people contacting her family being like, Mm. you know, you're so sorry your your daughter died, all of this stuff that I think it just was really intense. And it's interesting to think about what happens to actors when they're in a movie like this. Yeah, I mean, that that is really interesting that because, you know, you think this could be her big break. She is the star of this really popular movie, but that's not really how it turned out. And I think instead it was more of a burden. Yeah. So beyond the impact on the actors, the main thing I want to focus on is the impact of the real life town of Burkittsville, Maryland, where the Blair Witch Project is set. Mm -hmm. So there's tons of things that went on once this movie came out. But actually, even before the movie came out and this very intense marketing campaign was going on for the film. So I have a couple of tidbits and quotes I want to share. One is from Burkittsville's unofficial historian, uh, which is a guy. And he (laughs) said, for the record, there never was a Blair Witch, nor was the vicinity of Burkittsville ever known as Blair Township. Those claiming to have done their homework in this regard had better direct their gullible inquiries to the buffoons who crafted this fictional cinematic nonsense. We locals would appreciate it if they took their fantasies elsewhere. Ooh. Yes. Burn. (laughs) Sick burn. Yeah. (laughs) So in the weeks leading up to the release of this movie... It was just a constant parade of people coming to this town in Maryland trying to see for themselves the lore of the Blair Witch. And this town didn't expect this to happen, wasn't necessarily prepared for something like this to happen. And it came in the form of, one, phone calls and emails Mm -hmm. asking about the witch, but also asking about the people who were supposedly missing, asking, have you solved the murder? Have you found the people? So that just sort of shows, again, people like not really being sure if this was real. Mm -hmm. Then there was the added element of people kind of being a nuisance and more of a danger to the town. Mm. So the police issued notices to the residents that said, after viewing the movie, people may want to come out and see what Burkittsville is really like. We ask that you be cautious and reinforce safety precautions within your families. Mm. So people started locking their doors for the first time ever in this town. And they actually moved trick-or-treating off of the night of the 31st because they wanted children to be able to grab candy and go trick-or-treating without the like amount of people that would be coming to spend their halloween in a spooky town so like it really impacted the small town's life for a while yeah no it sounds like it the quote that we locals would appreciate it if they took their (laughs) fantasies elsewhere i feel like that's sort of the slam dunk of the story but also so many other rural communities, especially when the fantasies are sort of negative and violent as they are in in horror. And they're just like, this is just our town. This is just the place that we live in. It's not this dark secret that you guys are so eager to discover. Yeah. Like treating it as 
suddenly your town becomes an amusement park. It becomes a spectacle. But it's like real people's lives. And Mm. one other quote I want to bring up that made me think a lot about our last episode Mm -hmm. was a quote from the mayor at the time who said a lot of things. But one (laughs) part of her quote said, we are a Christian community. We have Mm. two local churches that have been established over 100 years. We take our Christianity seriously. Huh. And this is sort of another element of the response that's less about the stop having people come and vandalizing our graveyards, but whoa, 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 we are a Christian community. We don't have scary things like witches, which is a fascinating response it to is. this. It is. That's so interesting, especially because I would say that, you know, the large part of the American project is to not have communities that are just, hey, we're Christian and that's how it is. Um, yeah. But... <laughs> You know, in addition to that, it's like Christianity as the counterpoint for like, there can't be anything occult going on because we're mm-hmm. Christian, right? Um, as opposed to Children of the Corn, which is like, man, we're Christian. And, and you know, it's sort of yeah. <laughs> the improv. Yes, and. <laughs> yeah. And, and also, I mean, this whole situation makes me think sort of, when I think of spooky tourism, I think of New Orleans, I think of Savannah, mm-hmm. um, I think of sort of like the southern gothic cities which are one you know of course much larger than burkittsville but also have a way to channel all of this energy into a thriving industry and there's a lot of commentary on sort of ghost tours and and how they represent history and especially slavery and and things like that yeah but i think the, the point here is that when people come to these cities to do spooky time there is an industry of people who are employed to welcome them and show them around and say this is the spooky side of our city please come please give us your money when people just descended on burkittsville that's not how it was they were like we are very small and what are you doing here this has nothing to do with us right leave us alone please (laughs) yeah and i mean i think that's an interesting point because like you said they weren't you know hosting tours they weren't prepared for it for money making but there were some people that were able to make some good money from Mm. this unplanned tourism so a couple of examples um someone who had like just earlier been like don't come to the town then was like wait a second i can sell postcards so he found himself in the burkittsville postcard business and made a lot of money he sold about a hundred and a day wow (laughs) someone sold t-shirts with the movie's logo painted on it uh my favorite story is that someone sold rocks from her yard just (laughs) actual rocks like there wasn't anything about them love it someone was like hey can i have these rocks from your yard and she was like sure (laughs) ten dollars and i love that i think that's awesome yeah Um, that does rock you're like all right you're in my space take my rocks yeah i'll take your money so ironically all of these things the good and the bad the unwanted tourism and the money that was made from it shows up in the second Blair Witch, which I did not know anything about. Oh, are there? there's another one. Yeah, so it was not very successful. So Blair Witch 2 shows the stories of people becoming obsessed with the first movie and going back to the town. Huh. But what's so ironic to me about this movie is that they talk about how the townspeople didn't want this happening, Mm. but yet they did it again. So Mm. I'm going to play a quick clip from Blair Witch 2. I wish that they had used a fictitious town and possibly thought ahead toward what type of repercussions could come from using the word documentary in their advertising and on their website. Get out of these woods and go home! There is no goddamn Blair Witch! So yeah, I thought that that was a cruel Mm -hmm. irony of Blair Witch 2. And the final thing I'll say about Blair Witch is this was all, you know, the big craze in 1999 and then Blair Witch 2 came out in 2000, Hmm. but it died down but wasn't over for for Burkittsville because people still are trying to recreate the Blair Witch visit. There's Hmm. a Washington Post article from 2021 of Hmm. a reporter for the Washington Post spending a weekend in the Blair Witch haunted woods, you know, like this Mm -hmm. is still something that's happening and something that people are writing about, which is really fascinating. (laughs) Which, (laughs) yeah, no, it it, it is. And it's like at the same time that I'm like, huh, if I were driving through Maryland and there was a sign that said Burkittsville, I'd totally get off and check it out, right? Like I I would would absolutely feel that um, urge to do it. So I understand where people are coming from. Hopefully, if it's in lower concentrations now, they're not overrunning the town and yeah. people can get back to their lives in peace. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, so sort of while you were telling 
us about Blair Witch, there's a lot that it has in common with some of the places and stories that I was looking into, um, both in terms of the long-term effects for the actors and also, of course, the place. Um, and the first mm-hmm. one that I want to talk about that's sort of related is Deliverance. Mm. And, of course, Deliverance took place in northern Georgia in Rabin County. Um, they filmed on the Chichuga River, which was the stand-in for the Kahulawasi River, you know, which is fictional. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting ways in which life imitates art here is that at the time that Deliverance came out, Jimmy Carter was the governor of Georgia. Yeah. And after Deliverance, he managed to sort of spearhead an effort to get the Chattooga River declared wild and scenic, which means (laughs) that it can't be dammed in the way that the fictional river it was used as uh, was destined to be. Oh, interesting. And so it's like, you know, if you want to talk about sort of a positive lasting impact, the river itself, right, has now been protected largely as a result of the movie. And there is now about a $20 million per year rafting industry um, on the <laughs> river, right? Um, and it is, you couldn't get more direct, right? Because a lot of the people who worked on the movie were actually the ones that set up their, the first rafting businesses. Um, oh, interesting. The, yeah, the, the raft guides who were sort of responsible for getting the actors from one end to the other alive set up shop there uh, and started the first businesses, which continue in popularity today. Whoa. Yeah, and then another effect, right, was that because the movie was filmed so successfully in northern Georgia, it also inspired other people to start filming there. And Georgia started giving tax incentives and things like that to help build the industry. And so now there's a $7 billion film industry also Hmm. in Georgia, which, of course, was not the case before the movie. So those are arguably really positive economic impacts. But... (laughs) <laughs> uh, you may be shocked to discover that I would say the lasting cultural impact is is very different. Yeah. When I did an episode two, sort of the, the deep dive look at the killer hillbilly stereotype, Deliverance is credited in many of these histories with bringing that stereotype into a new genre and into a new era. And that, of course, is a lasting, really harmful stereotype. Mm-hmm. And, and so, and you can see that there is this sort of lasting tension between economic benefits and and cultural consequences. I found out that for the 40th anniversary of, of the movie, there was a Chattooga River Festival, which was, it was, they were trying to create a festival on the river. This was the first annual festival. And the theme that they made was deliverance. So this is in 2012. Hmm. Um, and so there's this really fascinating article that I found in... The Guardian, but I think was published elsewhere as well. And there's this really interesting discourse of different people that were interviewed uh, about how they felt about the festival and how they felt about the movie. This guy who was on the committee that organized the festival said, there was some pretty stiff opposition, but as a committee, we looked at it, figured it is what it is and figured people will get over it. It's going to benefit the people of the area, whether they like it or not. (laughs) Somebody else said... It portrays Rabin County as backwards, uneducated, scary, deviant, inbred hillbillies. Even today, when deliverance is mentioned, it raises unpleasant, unfounded images of the wonderful Appalachian hardworking people that live in this region. I would like it more if it had just been the Tatuga River Festival. I would not have had deliverance as a part of it. I think I agree with that person. Absolutely. (laughs) I think I agree with that person, too. Um, But the final quote of the story, which, you know, special trick when you're writing news articles, the final quote is the person that you're supposed to sort of leave with and go, yeah, I guess so. The final (laughs) quote of the story says, I think most everyone now is supportive. You always get a few curmudgeons around, but maybe they'll give us a break and let us have some fun. Interesting. (laughs) Who is that quote from? Um, That quote was from John Dillard, who owns the Dillard House Inn, uh, which I think would stand to benefit from people coming to 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 Mm -hmm. the festival so what did the theme mean for the festival did it mean that just marketing was around deliverance did it mean they had sort of homages to the movie yeah i think that they had screenings of it for example Mm -hmm. and yeah i think the you know when you think about the marketing for the festival it would imitate marketing for the movie and and there were just it was just very referential to the movie it's so interesting because i do totally understand what some of those quotes are saying that I'm sure it was good for business and it was good to get people to go, but I just can't, in my watching of the movie, I see truly nothing positive said about the area except for the beautiful scenic shots, Mm -hmm. which 
you would see if you were at the festival right. <laughs> there. So I, I just find it so interesting that it would be used as a promotional tool mm -hmm. because it, yeah, it doesn't feel positive to me at all. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think I also want to get into something about the people too. I mean, you had this really interesting point for Blair Witch about how for Heather Donahue, it was her big break and sort of her downfall. Mm -hmm. So Deliverance is sort of a star-studded cast in that the four main canoers uh, who are played by Burt Reynolds, Ned Beatty, John Voight, and Ronnie Cox. These are all pretty big names in Hollywood. And in fact, Ronnie mm -hmm. Cox totally attributes Deliverance to being his big break. What's interesting when you look up cast of Deliverance, uh, there's somebody who appears between John Voight and Ronnie Cox, and that is Billy Redden, who played Lonnie, who is the little boy that plays the banjo. Mm, yeah. In the 2018 documentary Hillbilly, which I referenced way back in episode two, they actually find Lonnie uh, and mm. ask him about his role in Deliverance and what that meant for him. He is working in a Walmart, I believe still in Georgia. And basically, the story he tells is that he was plucked out of his fourth grade classroom. They said, hey, you want to be in a movie? He was like, yeah, OK. And they shaved his head and put all this makeup on him. He didn't know how to play the banjo. And so they had to do like all sorts of camera tricks with his arms and stuff. But they wanted him to be the, the face of it. He was just excited to be in a movie. Uh, yeah. And he got paid. And of course, this was back in 1972. Uh, but he got paid $500. Hmm. And to this day, his dream is to go to Los Angeles. He doesn't know if he'll ever make it, but that's what he wants to do. Wow. Again, he was he was in the fourth grade when this movie was being made. He didn't know about how the people of Raven County were going to come off. And that's something that he's really struggled with as an adult. Uh, so here is a clip from the documentary talking about all of that. We had two directors looking for extras. And somehow they come in our class, got to look and, and picked two of us out. I, I wasn't the same, the same person that I was when they put that makeup, they had my hair cut. And it, and it, it kind of shocked me. When I first seen the movie, I didn't know that part was going to be in there. You know, I thought to myself, the people that's going to see that movie is going to think, man, that's the streets of Rabin County. Yeah, it's really hard to hear Billy talk about this experience and really understand, like we've been saying, that this film really did have a, a negative impact for so many people. So it's tough to see it then become themes of festivals. Yeah. And I mean, especially that he was a part of it as a child and now it's his sort of entire adult life has had this also hanging over him. Yeah. So I do want to talk about another movie, though, which I think sort of is a case study in the opposite direction. And in some ways, this isn't a very fair comparison because we are lining up a big budget Hollywood studio film from the 1970s mm, with sure. a independent film from 2018, which was sponsored largely by art funds and the Canadian government. Yeah. Um, but the other movie, of course, that I want to talk about is The Edge of the Knife, which yes. we introduced in the third episode about grief. And again, this is a Canadian movie that was created by two Indigenous filmmakers, and it tells the uh, one of the traditional stories of the Haida people who live on an archipelago of islands in British Columbia, north of Vancouver, uh, and their land is called Haida Gwaii. And the creation of this movie is opposite from Deliverance in every way. When you think of Deliverance as being more extractive, mm -hmm. it mostly didn't use local actors, except for when they wanted to make a point, as they did with Billy. The cast of Edge of the Knife is almost entirely local, including also the crew, many of whom are working on their very first yeah. movie. It is notable because it is in the Haida language, which, as we talked about before, is considered endangered. And also because of the vast community involvement at every level from writing the script and screenplay to translating it into Haida, which was done by the community's elders who were fluent in the language, language camps to help train the actors, which again were run largely by those elders. Mm -hmm. There was community buy-in, community support at every level. There's this YouTube video, which I'd encourage everybody to watch uh, after watching the movie, which is a talk back with the directors and some of the actors, the composer, etc., one thing that they talk about is that Haida Gwaii has a population of about 4,200 people. They had two screenings on Haida Gwaii, 
and over 1,100 people attended. Yeah, what's your statistical analysis on that? I would say that is slightly <laughs> over a quarter of the community <laughs> yeah, that's significant. Um, at large, which is a huge percentage, and that there were standing ovations, and people were really moved and really excited, and... Something that the director said was, well, you know, I'm not so worried about the critical reviews. What I care about is the elders. They'll let me know if Mm. I've messed up. I care about what the community has to say. They won't let it like they won't let it go if there's an issue. I just think that contrast between a movie that could not have cared less about the way it portrayed the local people and was doing it very much for an external audience versus a movie that was made largely for the community and if other people see it, that's great too. And I think it actually has been a really important movie for a lot of people to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll talk about another couple of movies after a quick break. I'm Olivia Weeks, a reporter for The Daily Yonder. I'm currently producing another series for the Rural Remix feed on the history of methamphetamine in rural America. If you want to hear more about that story, how meth went from a spectacular national panic to an endemic drug problem, and then eventually joined forces with synthetic opioids to produce the overdose crisis we face today. Stay tuned for a preview at the end of this episode. So another movie that was marketed as a true story, but in a really different way from a movie like Blair Witch, is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm -hmm. Because it... No one really believed that it's a true story, but it does sort of set up with like a text on the screen that's like painting it as a historical event, even if that wasn't really Mm. believed. But because of that marketing, they're able to get a lot of tourism from this movie. Yeah. One thing is that both the house and the gas station that are shown in the movie are now restaurants where people can visit. Uh, No human meat, though. Uh, Yes. Oh, no. Yeah. (laughs) That is is the funniest thing you could turn those two things into. I know. They knew what they were doing there. They did. (laughs) So the house of the Sawyer family has been a couple of different things, but was recently turned into a restaurant called Hooper's to pay homage to the original director and screenwriter, Toby Hooper. So this is a quote from the website of the restaurant Hooper's. It says, as you step inside, you'll find subtle and bold nods <laughs> to the history of the house, adding to the unique, intriguing atmosphere of our restaurant. Mm. I think that this is a pretty interesting way that movie tourism shows up, which is that you can eat in the restaurant of the cannibals. Mm-hmm. It's a very specific element of tourism, which is they know exactly what they're doing. They're bringing people to the restaurant. You can go experience a set piece from the movie that obviously looks very different now, but (laughs) they're drawing people to the area in rural Texas because of that. I'd go there. Really? (laughs) Yeah. I I mean, absolutely. You know, I have a fondness for silly roadside attractions, and that is really up there, I think, in terms of, of silly quotient. Definitely. I think it'd be interesting for sure. Beyond this very specific tourism, I think it's helpful to look at Texas Chainsaw Massacre as we kind of get into our wrapping up conversation of what this horror genre is all about because Mm -hmm. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a huge deal Mm -hmm. for horror movies. I think it's really often talked about as one of the the most famous, the most referenced, a really influential movie. I think there's a, a lot of things going on with it that made it so iconic. The low budget kind of DIY element of horror was pretty new at Mm -hmm. the time it came out and then it became one of you know the biggest trends thanks to the success of this film and others like it but when a movie like this was able to make so much money from such a low budget Mm -hmm. it really sparked an era of filmmaking that followed this trend a lot because i mean not anybody can do it but you you are not limited to just what the studios are willing to sponsor and pay for you can get smaller groups together and make your own things Exactly. And this idea that directors are rebellious, you know, they're making movies that are edgy and pushing the limits Mm -hmm. of movie restrictions uh, and the movie rating system. Because Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a really brutal, gory film, Mm -hmm. but actually it like sort of has a lot less blood and guts than a ton of horror films. Like Than it could, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Like you get an idea of what's going on. It doesn't make it any less horrifying and scary, but it takes away kind of some of the the glamour of movie and gives it a more 
realism, which feels ridiculous to say because it's such a ridiculous movie, Mm. but because it starts with, you know, this statement that maybe it's sort of a real story and it starts with a newsreel of events going on at the time, it gives it a documentary feel. Mm -hmm. It captivated audiences with this strange, rebellious realism grotesqueness Mm -hmm. that you see in a tons of horror movies afterwards yeah and you know you think about the camera work it's kind of shaky it's more the documentary style yeah and you know like you said while things on screen are really intense it also does pull its punches in a way like it does not show you Mm -hmm. everything that it could and for that i'm grateful (laughs) yeah me too and so this kind of begins an era of absolutely endless remakes prequels Mm -hmm. sequels that is essential to the horror movie genre Mm -hmm. Texas Chainsaw Massacre has sequels, prequels, remakes, video games, parodies, ripoffs. It's just replicated constantly. And this is true for so many horror movie franchises. Think Halloween, Friday the 13th, Saw, Nightmare on Elm Street, Paranormal Activity, The Conjuring. There's just countless numbers of these movies that are all under the same franchise. I think there are like seven or more Children's of the Corn. Yeah. I think what's really fun about these reboots and whatnot is that they spin around like crazy right like they'll do the sequel they'll do another sequel they'll do a prequel they'll do sequels that ignore the first two sequels and go straight after the movie and if you try to trace the lines of them like the narrative arc Mm -hmm. you can't it's all over the place but it's not really about continuing a story it's about creating more in that universe absolutely and that there's these iconic villains who you can have Mm -hmm. movies on just the backstory of the villain is really interesting Yeah, and I mean, something about that, right, is that when you have these franchises, the villain is the root of the franchise. It's not the victim. The the teenagers that are being chased through the woods are totally interchangeable. It's Jason who you're watching the movie for, right? And so in a way, these villains, which are really gruesome, are also the antiheroes because that's why you've come to see the movie. Yeah. And I think this will sort of get into our concluding conversation about the things we've been talking about for our whole series, horror movies are known for playing out the real world anxieties of the time that they're made in. Mm -hmm. So it's really helpful in making remakes because you can add in symbolism and horror to what's going on. So, I mean, I haven't seen the most recent Netflix remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but from what I've read about it, it's a conversation about gentrification, right? Mm. It's taking a current issue and adding it into the classic horror movie. Yeah, and especially when you think about the political origins of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Mm -hmm. where they're concerned about environmentalism, they're concerned about meat, they're concerned about, apparently, Watergate. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And now it's gentrification. Yeah, that's that's such an interesting... That would be a great project, is to sort of watch them all and and plot them in time. Right. And it is interesting because I feel the thing that would probably show up in all of the Texas Chainsaw remakes is Urbanoia, is Mm -hmm. an anxiety about rural people and places. Yeah. So I think that that remaining constant is a big deal because horror movies are a genre that are supposed to play out anxieties that everyone is feeling. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing again and again, you and I have seen come up. Yeah. And I think that that's a great point, especially when we talk about, of course, now Texas Chainsaw has become much more established as a genre, right? But when you're talking about low budget films, especially compared to higher budget studio films, low budget films can say and do whatever they want in a way that higher budget ones can't. I think you could see it when we talked about certain movies playing things out in maybe more conservative or less conservative ways, more conservative movies being Deliverance and Children of the Corn, more progressive movies uh, in that sense being things like The Hills of Eyes and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But mm-hmm. despite that, you're right that we the urban noise is something that we've come across in, in all of the movies. And while it is treated slightly differently, it still is there and it's still sort of foundational uh, to each one of these movies. And I think it's interesting that there's so much boundary pushing on so many levels, but not this level. Yeah, it's a really good point. You know, we chose horror for this podcast, one, because of the prevalence of rural settings that we observed, but I think also because of the things you just mentioned. And one thing I've been thinking a lot about is that a horror villain has a kind of imagery that sticks in your brain Mm. in a really notable way. Like you are going to remember Leatherface Mm -hmm. in your mind 
more than maybe a slightly problematic plot point in <laughs> a rom-com <laughs> that you see. Sure. It's just like, it has this imagery, and often when it's imagery depicting rural people, a horror villain is a really jarring way to describe something. Yeah, and I think that what you're saying about it sort of being a lasting image is important. And I think, you know, getting back to the purpose of this podcast these movies as a whole had so much to say about so many things. Mm -hmm. And yet, with the sort of exception of the loosely extrapolated eco-narrative behind the Killer Hillbilly, um, and even that, right, they're depending on the same shorthand, yep. which is rural as backwards and city as having progress across the board. And, you know, the reverse urban oil movies, the the parody of Tucker and Dale versus Evil almost pulls off an alternate narrative yeah. but by and large even though there's you know political commentary gender commentary religious commentary environmental commentary of all shades and stripes mm -hmm. i don't think i expected to see quite so much consistency in the foundational conceits of what rural means and what urban means i absolutely agree it's been a really interesting project to see this come up again and again and i feel that i'm gonna be noticing this across genres and in many other forms of media. And so I'm really glad that we took the time to think critically about this trope. Yeah, it's definitely been a journey, especially the part where we watched all the movies in <laughs> such a short amount of time. I think it has left a lasting impression on my psyche. <laughs> I've moved into a new place and I have a bunch of roommates and there is by the door a coat rack that always has at least a few coats and a bicycle helmet and the bicycle helmet <laughs> is at like head height and every time I go downstairs I'm like ah scary person and it's just <laughs> a coat rack and I'm gonna blame these movies <laughs> for my level of jumpiness yeah we're jump scared for the foreseeable future <laughs> <laughs> we are I'm jump scaring myself and that's not really <laughs> fair well, thank you listeners for being a part of this five-part series, and thank you, Anya, for chatting with me throughout all of these episodes. It's been so wonderful. Yeah, thank you. I have genuinely had a blast. Me too. The Rural Horror Picture Show is a production of Rural Remix. Original music was composed by Quincy Ponver and Leo Pozell. Cover art for the series was drawn by Nat Nichols. Thank you to our executive producers, Joel Cohen and Adam Georgie, associate producer, Teresa Collins, and the staff of The Daily Yonder and Rural Assembly. This series was edited and produced by Susanna Brown and Anya patron Slepian. Hi, Olivia Weeks again. Here's a preview of the reported podcast I'm working on about the history of methamphetamine and its reputation as a rural drug. Uh, my name is Tim. I um, was a meth addict for probably, I don't know, 15 years, maybe a little bit more. Were there any big changes that you noticed over the 15 years that you were using? Um, a couple big changes. I would say, well, the price on it would always get lower and lower, made it more abundant. Also, a lot more people started doing it a lot of a lot of people was doing just weed or doing coke or something like that and then uh next thing you know they wouldn't doing anything else but meth at all in the late 90s and early 2000s in some places more people than ever before had access to the recipe for cooking methamphetamine some u.s regions saw little to no meth production and some regions saw a lot mom and pop method came into missouri and it spread like wildfire it created a lot of issues because you had uh, fires, explosions, you had different chemicals that were used and stolen that began to proliferate, if you will. I felt like our town was just getting destroyed with meth. As those home labs gained attention, methamphetamine got a reputation as the hillbilly's cocaine. Experts say that this was partly because you needed wide open spaces to carry out the smelly cooking process, and partly because its early supply chain involved explicitly racist outlaw biker gangs. The association with out-of-the-way places was always exaggerated, but it stuck. 
Methamphetamine plus opioids has completely transformed the way we think about rural America. It's transformed the way people living in rural America think about themselves. And it's transformed the way people throughout the United States think about where our biggest drug and crime problems are located. Today, though domestic labs are all but obsolete, meth is more common and more dangerous than ever before. Meth is still, it is still the drug of choice, I would say, uh, but we've gotten a lot more opiates now. And now they're mixing the fentanyl with the meth, so you're getting a double whammy. Most of the meth on the streets now is produced in Mexico and smuggled in through official ports of entry. From there, the drug is dispersed all over the nation. So meth is no longer a particularly rural problem, but we haven't updated our stories about it. I'm Olivia Weeks, a reporter for The Daily Yonder. This podcast series tracks meth's trajectory from a chemical moonshine to an endemic drug problem, and sheds light on a crisis that remained quietly dominant in much of the rural U.S., even during the height of the prescription opioid epidemic. Why was the drug ever so explosive in small-town America? Why has its supply chain changed so dramatically in recent years? And how is meth's unique rise to fame still affecting policy decisions about synthetic drugs? This show investigates these questions and showcases the voices of all kinds of people interacting with meth, including people who use it, addiction treatment providers, legal system officials, and public health experts. Their stories are urgent and misunderstood. This podcast series will premiere early next year. If you or someone you know is interested in sharing your story, expertise, or audience, get a hold of us at news at dailyonder.com.